questions? Mary? I had a question for Rico. Um, so I was thinking about the um, the lecture la um, yesterday, I believe, on, on plant, you know, plant um, natural products, and so thinking along those same lines, I was wondering if. Uh, in your case, you have operons, but there is also the possibility for specialization, right? So that you could have orphan genes outside of the operons. But I was wondering if, uh, maybe more generally, the question is how what how you choose since you have so many candidate um, orphan operon or candidate operons to work from. How do you choose which ones you want to wake up? You know, is this based on novelty or, or because you know that there is not less of a possibility for this kind of specialization? So priority, yeah. prioritizing these gene clusters. Which which one do you want to wake first? So it depends on what you want. For us, it could be something that's completely novel. If you want a diverse chemical structure, then we could we can deduce from the gene sequences the kind of class of uh, natural products it will be. So we can go for something that's completely different, but also sometimes if you want different but similar activity, let's say, okay, we've got penicillin, but we want a different variety of penicillin, a modified penicillin, then you can choose those that are similar as well too. And in most cases in um, the microbes, it is clustered. These classes are usually clustered, unless if you've got like one enzyme step or something like this for uh, natural products. The modifying genes can be a uh, single enzyme somewhere else sometimes, but it's very rare. So most of the time in microbes it's all clustered. It's, this is the difference from plants, a big difference from plants. But the priority, yes, well for us it depends, like I said, on what you'd like to do in the end. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So I have a question for, for you, Eriko, which is um, how do you deal with um, best known cases, that is, uh, cases where you know <coughs> more or less what the actors are in the, in the, met the metabolic pathway leading to <coughs> various compounds uh, such as antibiotics, um, do you, can, can you apply uh, some metabolic uh, uh, computational analysis? Is it uh, has it been done? Has it been done successfully? Is it interesting from the point of view of setting up the uh, modifications, alterations to the pathway? What's the practice? So you're talking about um, the whole cell metabolic pathway, metabolic modeling, or is that is that what you're Yes, but uh, that that would focus on on the uh, pathways of interest for the production of. Uh, various compounds such as antibiotics. So you're just thinking of the biosynthesis pathways for yes. the antibody. Yes. Uh, is there metabolic engineering going on there? Right, because or there, there's... modeling, rather modeling. Yes, 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 because there are some bifurcations sure. and stuff, so it's not directly uh, easy. Yeah, it, well, I don't know if it's as... It's not as easy as a normal primary metabolism modeling. I think it's just as difficult, in fact. But uh, not a lot of people have done this. But having said that, the companies who actually produce compounds um, as a, a product, they know a lot about these enzyme pathways. They know which ones are limiting, which ones are not limiting, and they go off and, and change them. So in a way they are modeling these pathways as well to, to understand which enzymes they need to go up, down, for example, or cofactors as well is a, a big thing, and also um, the starting material, substrates. If you don't have enough substrates, that's of course a problem as well. So it's not published as modeling these pathways per se, but industry has lots of background knowledge, I think, for modeling. But I think it's also interesting to do too. Yeah. Questions? I think uh, we've seen that the refactoring of, uh, of this metabolic operon can be very uh, challenging. I'm sure you're aware of the work of uh, Chris Voigt, for instance. Uh, so what, what's your 
take on that? Uh, uh, do you think that there could be also alternative approaches uh, to complete refactoring, like for instance, adopting the sigma factors from the host where it comes from, or different things like that? Sure, Any absolutely. On this? So I think it was really unfortunate. Chris did a great work. I'm, I'm not. I don't have anything against Chris's work at all. It's just that he chose a pathway that was primary metabolism <coughs> pathway, really associated with nitrogen fixation. So if he had chosen a different pathway, a little bit more simplistic pathway, perhaps he would have gotten a better result. So I'm alluding to the fact that Chris's group did a lot of refactoring, and in the end, their production of the fixing the nitrogen was the same as wild type after they refactored it. So perhaps if they used a different pathway, maybe it would have been better, perhaps. Um, I think, you, yeah, your idea is great. Why not? You can do lots of other things, put different things into refactor pathways. Sure. So I think, yes, yes, I think, I hope I'm answering your question. So you, you can do lots of things. You can, like I said, with the refactoring, promoters are important. Ribosome well, binding sites are important. Both strengths are important. Terminators are important. Directions of the genes are important. All of these things you have to think about and you just have to dissimulate it and try it. So this is for um, a general question, not only for you, but maybe for the whole audience. So um, I, I just wonder about the long-term stability of the constructs that we make in the laboratory, right? So. Um, you know, when you want a population to obey your orders, you have basically two strategies. One of them is to enslave the, 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 the population and then to punish all those that do wrong. Or you can try to make your empo your employees happy and then they do the, the work happily and then they may, um, uh, you know, be, be working for you for, for much longer. So uh, I think that the only strategy that we have been using from the beginning is to punish bacteria that do wrong that do wrong to, to, to your orders, but I just wonder whether we can think of some type of increasing bacterial happiness by the time that we um, that, that, that we engineer them to do something. You know, um, microbiologists are paranoid about bacterial stress, but I'm interested in bacterial happiness, so I, I don't know whether people have figured out ways of making bacteria happy at the same time that they are in our structure, because maybe we, we do that the long-term behavior would be more stable and more predictable. So what's happy for the bacteria? That's what we're that's what we're well, happiness for bacterium is easy. It's growing. No! It isn't. No. It isn't. It's not. Right. But that's the only thing that they understand. It. No, because no. Yeah, you have this phenomenon called caloric restriction. I mean, if you grow fast and get fat, it's not a good idea. So you have to find the right thing. Well, the human species is proving you wrong, right? <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to, uh, to, to 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 follow up on uh, Victor's um, uh, suggestion and the uh, uh, fairy tale about uh, microbial happiness and so on. Uh, in terms of, it depends whether y y your bio process is going to be um, um, static. You know, you do fed batch and then you use it for making uh, something, or you are going to have proliferation along the way which is a very different thing. So, in terms of, uh, in Darwinian terms, leaving more progeny is happiness. No, no matter what it takes, you know, resisting radiation, uh, storing fat at some point, or phosphorus for using it. There are many, many algorithmic ways of representing it, but leaving more progeny is okay. And I think at this current stage of uh, understanding life, we are absolutely, it's beyond our understanding to do evolutionary design. Like, not only could we construct something that would even that is a is a true achievement to have something like like you describe um, uh, then having the proper uh, maximizing the formation of uh, some secondary metabolites by uh, fine tuning uh, shine down and so on but this will be for just let's say a few generations now if you grow a culture like that the first thing it will do is get rid of this violas viola saying of our liking you see what i mean so how are you so evolutionary design we have not even started to think even to pose to 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 uh, to make uh, the statements the specifications about it there are only empirical things and i think the main concern about this is how to prevent dissemination so there is some efforts ongoing in several labs because that's the least that we cannot um, promise to the public 
not having our Frankenstein violin saying, uh, making bugs spreading in Amazonia or wherever. But this is only the beginning. And I think it is, you know, uh, since uh, we are uh, gather regularly now, I think that this evolutionary design uh, part should become a systematic um, uh, session, systematically unforced session together, or aside by a bricks and things which are far less importance for the future. That's a suggestion. Can I, can I just respond? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Is it you first or? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, you said that to proliferate is the happiness for the bug, right? Not but me. Then the bug Charles says, Darwin said. Uh, <laughs> but then they also die. So does that mean you want long-lived bacteria or you, you just want numbers? What do you think? It depends. Happening? You know, I know species of uh, jellyfish, you know, the males just burst out in sperm cells. But they are happy doing this because <laughs> next generation they will burst even better, but the number of jellyfish increases the speed. So it depends, depends exactly. You could say the, the figure of merit that I want to improve is this, and then algorithmically you could try to figure out how to increase that particular trait. But we must keep in mind that it is the very uh, capability of, of generating more progeny that the species of the creature that we are evolving or engineering are after. But they can die. What? They can die if you have lots of babies, you it's, can die. It's a mortality <laughs> rate. No, they, 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 they must not all die, of course. But you, you must tell them. Just one comment, or maybe two comments, to the happiness of bacteria. Mm -hmm. I think at the end, bacteria always uh, find strategies somehow to maintain the species. That means somehow to survive. And this means sometimes faster growth or sometimes uh, better stress adaptation depends on the situation. And one point what we observe very often is that they form under certain conditions many, many different subpopulations. And when I look for all these modeling studies, I mean, how we ever want to integrate these subpopulations <coughs> is another challenge, which is, of course, almost <coughs> underestimated. And I mean, you can just knock out one gene and suddenly find heterogeneous be behavior, or you can overproduce and find homogeneous behavior. So you can never predict. <coughs> Any comment on your side? <coughs> Humble appreciation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'll take a different stance. I think you can predict to some extent because you can analyze the different components that you're engineering into things like bacteria and work out what the relative fitness decrease of running that component will be for the cells in the conditions you want to grow. You can analyze DNA sequence and look at the predictability from the sequence level of their that sequence being deleted or changed due to things such as um, repeat sequences. Uh, maybe, for example, the way you've cloned your plasmid leaves a similar sequence multiple times, and that then is going to have a more likely chance of being ejected out later in design. So although I don't think we can easily work out ways to keep the growth rate perfect to avoid our engineered bugs from being outcompeted by ones that have not been engineered or that have got some mutation. We can do things about the design that can improve our chances that our design, our DNA will be kept for longer periods of time because certain components cost the cell less effort, so RNA-based regulation, probably less cost to the cell than transcription factor-based regulation and designs that avoid certain sequences where transposons are easily going to come in and cause damage to your DNA can also be avoided. So you, you can do something about it. But ultimately, I don't think we really want to get to the point where they grow even better than wild-type E. coli, because, for example, if you're doing this work in E. coli, that would be breaking um, what was set out at Asilomar, in that our lab work in E. coli would not create strains that grew faster and were fitter than the wild-type natural ones. All right, if I may interject my own uh, view of that, I think it's a matter of domestication and styles of how we domesticate bacteria, yeast. Think of cows and, and, and uh, maybe some wheat and, and corn. Um, from that point of view, actually, there is probably an incentive if you want your bug to run during months in a 1,000 cubic meter fermenter and not change properties too much 
to be perhaps a bit on the nice side of domestication that the cells are somewhat happy with what you added to their constituents so that they stay robust. And Philip does not agree, so actually no, it's I not the end because of the I, I know the complaint of yogurt makers, you know? So they are making uh, cubic meters of yogurt every day that God makes, and sometimes it it tastes like cat piss and it's so because some viruses were there that to resist it, you know. So the 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 only way they have sometimes it represents millions of euros actually when a, when a, a ferment of sugar sure. like that uh, is lost. So so they have to it's they have a real incentive in understanding and steering this evolutionary thing. And they have absolutely no model, no way, no other thing like no more than so many generations and so on. So it, I, that's what I said earlier, I'm sorry to repeat myself. This thinking has not even started. So there's a follow-up of what Philip says, um, and is that, you know, you said we have to think on evolutionary engineering. Design, design. Part of the design so should be able to Okay, work. so what, what I want is to have things that don't evolve at all. So, uh, of course, and, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, what we want is a assistance that, you know, um, can be right out. Definitely. And then that takes me to, to the other uh, side of the coin, is this issue about growth. So I think that one of the big problems also in engineering and so on is that we are growth, and that's how that's a, a, a component of the whole system that makes the whole thing very different from what an engineer has. So a, a, an Airbus does not grow or, or a radio does not grow, right? So I just wonder whether we can also, uh, we're also thinking about three in terms of something that grows all the time. So I would like uh, to have what would be to something that we would call an adult bacteria. So we grow at the beginning, then we have a long adult life, we do our jobs and everything, and then we peacefully die. So can we think on adult bacteria that they don't grow, however they do what they ask them to do and, and, and everything? So I think that it's been touched um, laterally this issue of uncoupling growth from activity, and to this day I think that this is still a big issue. I mean, how can we use synthetic bio to uncouple altogether? Um, growth from a catalytic activity, not stressing the cells because this is the standard way to do it, and still happy having a, a, a happy adult catalyst. I don't know. Any other ideas about that? If I had them, I would most probably not uh, communicate them here. <laughs> Rather silently pursue them. I think uh, your problem description is very accurate. Um, I uh, also the solution would be great. Um, I think, um, nevertheless, it's remaining a very tricky uh, endeavor because these regulatory processes that define whether the cell is happy to whatever uh, definition um, can not really be pinned down to a limited number of things. We need to turn this up, we need to turn this down. Um, so the, to me, they seem to be distributed over a large number of aspects, um, and to change them will A, require better understanding, and B, uh, lots of interventions at different spots. So I, I, think the, I, I think what you describe is great, but it will take some time. I can add a comment, perhaps. So antibiotics, or secondary metabolites, as you know, are not produced in primary metabolites. They wait until they stop or reduce growth, and that's the only point when they start producing. So maybe they're happy producing these <laughs> compounds uh, because they're not competing with growth. So one of the ideas, of course, of pharmaceutical companies, and we did before as well, was to engineer so that they only produce when they stop growth. You en engineer the expression so they come on only you, when you have a fixed mass, and then you can switch it on and off whenever you want. So I had a question for Pablo. Um, so it was uh, one of your final results was very nice that you showed uh, that biofilm uh, or, or organisms in biofilm had higher uh, degradation of the chlorobutane. I was wondering if you had maybe at this early stage, but any speculation at least on mechanism for for this. Is it greater chemical resistance or? Well, one of the things that for sure is different in a biofilm is the way the cells can withstand the substrate. It's extremely toxic, so you can only add it up to 0.5 millimolar. So, um, 
cells in the biofilm are much more resistant to the substrate itself, which is toxic, than in the planktonic state. That's why we think we recover most of the diagenase activity in the biofilms. Thank you.